it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I used to be a park ranger, and there are some things people need to know about what's in the forests by Arya Bird. Part 1 Five years ago, I became a park ranger. Oh, I won't include the location of this event. I don't want anyone seeking out the utter horrors I've seen in that forest. When you think that you're prepared for whatever the forest might throw at you, you hear about the strange occurrences from other rangers, the missing persons cases, the unusual animals that are like nothing you've ever seen before. <laughs> I was arrogant. I just blew off these stories. The other more experienced rangers told me there's nothing but paranoia or attempts to scare the new guy. But I was wrong. I was so very wrong. I had to tell this event to someone to warn people of the things that are out there hiding in those deep woods, just waiting for that bold individual to walk right into their clutches. This is the reason I will never return to that forest, and now live in a large city. I avoid the forest that I used to love so much because I'm terrified of what I'll find in them, or what will find me. Three months into my time as a park ranger, it was the beginning of spring, well, for the past two weeks, we've been receiving strange reports from park visitors and a few fellow rangers. People have been seeing strange warped-looking animals wandering about the park. The animals sighted often looked thin with patches of missing hair. Their completely white eyes were gaunt and almost skeletal, and the proportions of the animals were said to well, just seem wrong, as if the animals were just not completely convincing copies of the animals they were supposed to be. Of course, most of us just assumed there was some sort of disease starting to affect animals in the park. There was an older park ranger who'd started at the park a month before the sighting started, named Briggs, who warned us that he'd seen this before. He was worried and was insisting we should close up the park. He said that these animals were dangerous and a safety hazard to anyone inside the forest, but he wouldn't say any more than that. He always just looked haunted when he talked about those animals, I said the forest wasn't safe anymore. Of course, we just wrote him off as being a kooky, paranoid older guy who probably had some kind of traumatic wild animal attack experience. We didn't even entertain the possibility that he might be right. And our hubris would be our downfall. I still remember something Briggs said to me one day shortly before he quit working at the park. It was always weird to me that Briggs was so disturbed by these animal reports and looked so haunted when he talked about them. He was a big man in his late seventies, but he could have easily wiped the floor with any youngster who tried to step up to him. He was an ex-Navy SEAL and a tough and real smart son of a gun. I was surprised he was so superstitious and paranoid that we should close up the park when it just seemed like some outbreak of a disease among some of the wildlife. All in all, it didn't seem like that big a deal at the time. Riggs wouldn't say specifically why he was so insistent on closing up the park. All he would say to me on the subject was, ah, There's things in that forest you couldn't comprehend, boy. Things that'll break a grown man in two like a twig. Yeah, they're smart, you know. We think we're the apex predator of this world, but we couldn't be more wrong. If you aren't afraid, you're a fool. Now they're coming out in droves, and I don't know why. I don't plan on being here to find out. I've seen the horrors of war, Sonny, and what I saw on the battlefield is nothing compared to what I've seen in that forest. Do the wise thing. Listen to this old timer before it's too late. Well, I just wrote off what Briggs had told me. But now, I wish I hadn't. If I could go back and change what I'd done, yeah, well, it's too late now and the horrors I saw will stick with me as long as I live. One week after Briggs warned us to close down the park, he quit and left the park behind. He was the smart one. He knew what was coming and didn't want to be around when all hell broke loose. I saw a glimpse of one of those strange animals on one of my patrols within that week, but it just looked like a sick raccoon to me. I thought nothing of it, and it was gone before I could attempt to catch it. But within five weeks of these sightings beginning, 
things had started to become stranger. We'd had ten reports from park visitors of being attacked by these sickly looking animals, and all of them had told us the same thing. The animals seemed intelligent now, like they were hunting them. And not only did they seem intelligent, they also seemed angry. We were bewildered and unsure of what to make of the situation. Well, we'd been trying to hunt down and put down the sick animals since the reports had started. We decided it was wiser to put down these animals to keep the sickness from spreading, but the animals remained elusive. The most any of us were able to do was catch occasional glimpses of them, but that all changed one night on the sixth week of the sightings. We'd also had ten missing persons cases brought to our door within the past two weeks. Though we were unsure if this was attached to the sick animal sightings, and were unable to find any traces of the missing people, aside from some abandoned belongings and campsites. On a seemingly peaceful summer night, three of us were at the ranger station on the overnight shift. It was myself, Hank, a tough hulking man in his early thirties, and Lida, a petite girl in her late teens who was interning at the park over the summer. We had increased employee presence in the park due to the strange animal behaviour of the past two or so months, close to ten at night when we had a hysterical young blonde woman rushing into the station. She was covered in dirt and scratches, her clothing in tatters. She looked wild, like someone who had been lost in the forest for weeks. She was sobbing, babbling, and collapsed into the arms of Hank. I started to check her for and treat her injuries as we tried to calm the woman down enough for her to speak clearly. After an hour, we managed to calm her down enough for her to be able to speak in somewhat coherent sentences. She was still hard to understand, but we managed to get the gist of what she had to say. The woman told us that she'd been camping in the park with her four friends. They'd set up camp in the morning and everything had seemed normal, but after the sun set, things started to become strange. They started to hear odd noises coming from the forest and swore that they even heard talking. The voices sound garbled and growled, almost like someone who still wasn't completely sure how to form words. They'd started to feel on edge and had decided to leave first thing in the morning. They were too scared to venture out into the forest in the middle of the night with the strange noises they were hearing. She told us that after an hour of hearing the strange noises coming from the forest, a stumbling and almost hairless, sickly, gaunt coyote with pure white eyes came out of the forest and started venturing into the clearing where they'd set up camp. The coyote was making strange noises, like it was in pain, and the closer it got, the easier it was for them to see that the coyote seemed, well, off. She said that the coyote seemed just a little too long and too tall to be a coyote, like it had been stretched or something. As he got closer, her friend Trace got scared and decided to throw a rock at the coyote to scare it off. He threw a fist-sized rock at the coyote and hit it square in the head. Well, the rock hit it, and it collapsed to the ground. After the rock had hit the coyote, the forest seemed to go completely, well, still, almost like time had stopped. The only sounds the five of them could hear were their own terrified breathing and the crackling of the campfire. They thought Trace had killed it, and in the eerie silence, they could see that it wasn't breathing. But then the coyote's body jerked. Strange cracking noises could be heard from its body as it twitched and contorted. Its body changed into an almost humanoid shape as it rose up on two legs. The coyote then bared its teeth at the five of them in a sneer, and then opened its mouth. They heard the coyote speak two chilling words in a deep, guttural voice. Feeding time. These two words seemed to send the forest into chaos as creatures of varying shapes and sizes swarmed from the tree line upon the five campers. Not all the animals even seemed to look like animals or like anything the girl had ever seen before. The creatures dragged the five of them through the forest to a cave, dragging them inside into what seemed to be a dark and massive cave system. This is something I found strange, considering that the only caves we had in this park were relatively small. There should have been nothing in that park like what this girl was describing. She told us that the animals dragged them into this cave system and trapped them in some kind of sticky, 
wispy substance that seemed almost like spiderwebs, but with the strength of thick rope. She said she could barely remember what happened after that, since she couldn't see at all in the pitch black cave. All she could hear was the occasional screams of terror and pain from her friends, and the squelching noises of what she knew was her friends being eaten. She wasn't sure how long she was in there. What she guessed was every few days one of them would be taken and fed upon by what she could only guess were the creatures that took them into the caves. These creatures would also force feed her water and food every so often. Though it was clear from her gaunt and emaciated figure that they only fed her enough to keep her alive. She said she was fed some kind of mush she was never able to identify, only that it tasted utterly foul and almost like something rotten. When it was finally her turn to be eaten, she got lucky. She felt the threads that bound her being cut by what seemed to be some large claw or knife, and then she crashed to the cave floor. In a panic, she managed to grab a large rock. She struck out in the darkness towards where she believed the thing that had cut her loose to be. And she could tell she made contact with something and heard a growl of pain as the creature hit the ground. And she didn't wait to figure out how much damage she'd done, she just ran. She ran for what felt like hours. She could hear the sounds of growls and what seemed like garbled speech that she couldn't understand all around her, but somehow she managed to avoid the creatures who were hunting for her. She managed to escape the cave system and just ran blindly through the forest in the dark until she found the ranger station. After finishing the story, she just burst into sobs and begged us to protect her from the monsters that she thought were still chasing her. We realized, after hearing her story, that she was part of a group of five campers who'd gone missing in the forest two weeks earlier. It was a group of college students who'd come to the park on summer break, but after the first day of their camping trip, their families and friends had stopped hearing from them. After three days of no contact from the students, we'd been notified that these campers were to be considered officially missing. We'd been contacted by the families even earlier than that, and had run some preliminary searches, but... Well, like the five other missing persons that had cropped up in the past two weeks, we'd only found an abandoned campsite and belongings from the campers. After some closer inspection of the girl and some coaxing for her name, we managed to identify her as one of the two missing girls, Abigail. At the time, we believed that Abigail and her friends were likely drugged and attacked by some dangerous individuals in the forest. It was easier to think that Abigail had just crafted this unbelievable narrative as a way to comprehend what had happened to her while she was kept heavily drugged and docile. I mean, after all, what sane and reasonable person could honestly believe the wild tale that Abigail had spun? We left Abigail to eat and discussed among the three of us for a bit what to do with her. We were quick to decide that the best course of action was to notify law enforcement that we'd found Abigail that there were likely a group of dangerous individuals currently residing in the park. The three of us felt very disconcerted after hearing Abigail's story, but knew that we couldn't very well abandon our post in the early hours of our shift. At that point, we all just wanted to get Abigail somewhere safe, and really wanted to leave the park, even though we couldn't. First, I tried to call the police through the office phone, but the line was dead. That far out in the middle of nowhere, phone service can be notoriously unreliable, so our mobiles couldn't be used to call the police either. The office phones were really our only way to contact the outside world, unless we felt like wandering about until we managed to possibly get a bar of service. With the phone lines down, we just decided to shut down for the night and take Abigail to the police station ourselves. As we were gathering our things and shutting off the lights for the night, we all moved with a mutual sense of urgency. Human instinct is a powerful thing, and at that moment all of us seemed to sense that something was wrong. Suddenly, Abigail started screaming loud enough that I was sure she could actually crack the windows. She started pointing towards the window straight across from the couch she sat on and screeching, It's here. They're here. You have to help me. They're coming for me. Initially, I thought that the girl was just hysterical, but that was until I saw it. The thing was exactly like Abigail had described. It was a too tall bipedal thing with gangly but muscled limbs and a patchy furred body. 
Well, it had to be at least eight feet tall, what with the way its torso was the only part initially visible when I looked out of the window. When it crouched down and tapped a clawed hand on the glass, I saw it had the head of a coyote with those milky white eyes. It grinned and let out a growl. Come out, it purred in a gravelly, sing-song voice. Abigail screamed and backpedaled away from the window, hiding behind and latching onto Hank while yelling that we needed to escape and begging us not to let them take her. I was frozen in fear. I was in no way equipped to handle this. I was just an average guy from Iowa with no special skills to speak of besides being decently athletic with an encyclopedic knowledge of the outdoors. The only thing I could do at that moment was stand frozen and staring in horror at the thing peering at us through the window and chuckling at our terrified faces. Surprisingly, what snapped me out of my shell shock state was Lida. She was the only one out of us who didn't look scared. Instead, she looked angry. She smacked me across the face hard enough to leave my ears ringing. Then she proceeded to do the same with Hank. Hank and I shared mirrored surprised expressions that Lida was so quick to action and that her small form could hit that hard. Get your shit together. You all need to get the hell out of here, Lida yelled at the three of us. She then proceeded to remove a black pistol from her pastel blue backpack. Oh, a multitude of questions were rushing through my mind. At the top of that list was wanting to know what the hell that thing outside was, and right below that was bewilderment at Leader's 180 shift from a bubbly, perky teenager to acting like some battle-hardened veteran. I didn't have much time to spend on these musings, however, as we heard the window crack. The coyote thing had placed a hard punch to the window that had caused it to fracture. One more good hit would surely shatter it. Then Lida raised her gun and fired. The bullet shattered the window and sent the coyote crashing back to the ground. Hurry! Get to Hank's truck! Get your fucking guns! Lida yelled. Hank and I already had our shotguns out and ready due to the reports of animal attacks so we were able to snatch them up quickly as Lida took the lead to head for the front door. Abigail continued to stick close to Hank, silently, with wide, terrified eyes as we moved cautiously for the door. Lida threw open the door, and I was shocked at what we were faced with. There were at least thirty of those warped animals that we'd heard so much about, and at the head of them was the coyote, with a now missing left arm and the shoulder stump looking like it had healed over years ago. Coyote was the only one to be in bipedal form. The other animals looked warped in various shapes and sizes, some being recognizable animals and others simply looking like horrifying beasts that I'd never seen before. The only thing they all had in common was those white eyes. The coyote snarled and seemed to focus its attention on Lida. I all pay for that, it growled out. Lida sneered at the coyote in response. Oh, shove it, you overgrown flea bag. She shot back as she reached into her backpack and produced a flare which she was quick to light and hold out in front of her. The creatures recoiled at the light and the coyote let out a deep, unearthly growl. She hurled the flare into the crowd of animals and they scattered with unnatural speed back from the flare. Go! Lita yelled and the four of us made a break for it to the parking lot while we had the opening. Leader took the lead, taking a shot at any of the creatures who tried to leap at us as we ran. Her bullets seemed to have a strange effect on these creatures. The moment they hit, black liquid bubbled up from the injuries, and the things were screeching in pain as their bodies seemed to start to dissolve into that black liquid. Hank and I took a few shots at the things, but our bullets didn't seem to do much more than knock the creatures back briefly. When we did get to the truck, we all quickly piled in with Hank in the driver's seat, and he gunned it towards the exit to the park right after the engine roared to life. I let out a breath of relief, as I thought we were home free. Don't start relaxing. We're not out of the woods yet, Lida scolded me, and then offered a hint of a smirk at the terrible joke she'd just made. I looked at her in disbelief for a moment, before an uneasy chuckle escaped from Hank and me, appreciating her attempt at calming the three of us, at least. 
Lady Smirk quickly faded as she focused her attention on the blurred view of the forest outside the car as Hank sped along the road. So, um, who the hell are you? Hank asked as he kept his eyes focused on the road. But it was clear the question was meant for Lida. It was an unspoken question that had been hanging in the air ever since Lida had jumped into action to deal with that coyote thing back in the ranger station. I'll tell you what, Hank. I'll give you a nice, lengthy explanation after we're out of the forest full of things itching to get at us. Sound good? She responded flatly. Hank gave a sigh in response. Fine. Fair enough. Do you at least know what those things are? He pressed. Yep, Lida said shortly. And then she sighed heavily. All you need to know is that they're really hard to kill. If you want to bring them down, you'd better aim for the vitals. They won't stop moving until their bodies are completely destroyed. Their eyes are sensitive to light and they'll naturally flee from it. Fire also does a nice job of doing heavy damage to them. You manage to engulf one in flames and they'll go up like a bonfire doused in gasoline. But get back quick before they explode unless you want to go smelling like roadkill that won't wear off for weeks. Exception to the flame rule is that coyote thing. Fire will hurt it, but it's not enough to kill it. Yuck. <laughs> If something fucks up, you leave me to deal with a coyote while you all focus on escaping. The coyote gets taken out, and the animals will stop attacking. There'll still be those things, but they won't be coordinated anymore. So I'll give you all the opening you need to get out, she explained. I stared at Lita with wide eyes, wondering how exactly it was she knew all this. I could tell that Hank was wondering the same thing. But it was clear this was all Lita was willing to tell us at the moment. Abigail remained quiet in the back seat with me. She was just staring out of the window with wide, vacant eyes. Not that I could blame her after all she'd been through. I guess she just needed time to process everything. If I could speak up and ask Abigail anything, I had a loud metallic crunch, and then we were airborne. I caught a flash of brown fur before the truck tumbled off the road, rolled down a steep hill and came to a rest on its roof, having been stopped by a large pine tree. I sat, suspended in the air by my seatbelt, with my ears ringing and my body trying to process the shock of the crash. I was snapped out of my day state by a leader, cursing loudly. Shit, the truck's fucked. She huffed out as she unclicked her seatbelt and crashed to the roof of the car. Is everybody okay? She asked as she shifted to look at the rest of us. Lida had a deep cut on her right cheek and forearm with some various cuts and bruises scattered across her form as well, but she seemed mostly unharmed. I'm okay, I think. I choked out before undoing my seatbelt as well and hitting the roof of the car with a pained grunt. Aside from some cuts and being sore as hell, I was fine as far as I could tell. Hank was similarly mostly unharmed, aside from a thick bit of glass that had gotten stuck in his left bicep, but that was able to be quickly tended to by Lida by taking the glass out and tearing off a bit of his sleeve to tie around the wound. Abigail appeared to have passed out from the crash. She had a few deep gashes on her forearms and some smaller scratches, but otherwise she seemed unharmed. However, she was unconscious, and it was difficult to assess how she really was until she woke up. Something odd I noticed about her that I wish I'd paid more attention to was that her blood looked almost black. But I just assumed I was seeing things because of the poor lighting and already being very on edge. Hank and I gently removed Abigail from the wreckage of the truck while Lida surveyed the damage and tried to figure out exactly where we were. The truck was an absolute wreck. The passenger side had collapsed inward like something heavy had made impact with it and the resulting roll down the hill and crash into the pine tree had completely totaled the truck. We were lucky the truck was as sturdy as it was, or we would have surely walked away with worse injuries than we had. We'll have to continue on foot from here, Lida said, before placing a hand over Abigail's mouth and giving her a hard smack to the cheek to see if she could wake her. Well, Abigail woke with a start, but her resulting scream was muffled by Lida's hand over her mouth. Once Abigail took in her surroundings, Lida tore the sleeves off her own shirt and used the cloth to treat Abigail's wounds on her forearms. Come on, we need to get moving before they catch up with us, she barked. 
the three of us follow behind Lida. With Abigail in between the three of us, considering her unarmed and mostly unresponsive state. We all moved at a brisk walking pace, sticking to the shadows of the tree line, but never completely leaving the view of the road, just in case a car happened to come by. For a while, we were able to continue on without interruption. The forest was almost completely quiet. Not even a sound from an insect could be heard. The only sounds we could hear were the occasional howl or growl in the distance, and the sounds of our footsteps and heavy breaths. Despite the terrors of the night, this was perhaps one of the most terrifying parts to me. That utter quiet, and the sense that at any moment one of those things could rush from the forest to do who knows what. And then, the silence was broken as a thing that resembled a large deformed porcupine the size of a wolf rushed at us from the underbrush. Leader fired off a bullet into the creature's chest before it could make contact, and it screeched and quickly started to dissolve as it writhed on the ground. And the sounds of more growls and rushing footsteps could be heard as reinforcements pushed towards the area, attracted by the gunshot and the screeches of pain from the porcupine-like creature. <laughs> Run! Leader yelled, before breaking off into a sprint. The three of us quickly followed, with Abigail pulling ahead of Hank and myself despite her frail condition. She had enough sense to at least not run out ahead of Leader, but her swift movements were startling. At the time, I chalked it up to adrenaline. We ran with the sounds of those creatures pursuing us, filling the forest around us. Leader, Hank, and I fired off the occasional shot when one of the things tried to jump at us from the forest, but we managed to keep ahead of the creatures. Or at least, that's what we thought, anyway. As we emerged out into a large clearing, the moonlight illuminated the coyote, who seemed to be even larger than the last time we'd seen it. Though its left arm was still missing, behind it stood a large half-circle of those creatures, of numbers of at least fifty, who all stood waiting, hissing and snarling as if they desired nothing but to charge and tear us apart. Leda didn't hesitate to raise her gun and take a shot at the coyote, but when she did, all that sounded was an empty click. She was out of bullets. Oh, shit she said softly under her breath, quickly reaching to the side pocket of her backpack as if reaching for more ammo. Before she could reach the side pocket, a squirrel-like thing the size of a large dog came crashing down from the tree above and smacked into her back. Lida cursed as she struggled against the creature, but it held firm. Hank raised his shotgun to try and shoot the squirrel creature off of Lida, but as he made that move, he was knocked to the ground by the small, frail form of Abigail. She'd landed a hard elbow to his ribs that caused a loud crunch. Well, Hank groaned in pain as he instinctively curled into himself, and Abigail took that opportunity to pin him to the ground on his stomach with a two-wide grin settling on her features that showed sharp teeth. Well, her eyes were white now, like all those other fucking things. As she held him, her body started twisting and crunching as her limbs grew longer and distorted, with her skin taking on a papery white shade with a grey tinge. She bit into the side of Hank's neck, and he let out a pained, gurgled sound as she took a chunk out of the side of his neck. Oh, damn it! Hank! Lita yelled as she struggled against her captor. And then she looked at me with an intense gaze. Get out of here! She roared with a tinge of desperation in her voice. And in that moment... My survival instincts took over, and I listened. It was as if my body had gone into autopilot while my mind raced. I thought that I couldn't just leave Lida and Hank behind, and I had to stay and try to save them. But even as I thought this, I kept running like my body had a will of its own, separate from my mind. I tore through the forest, everything fading into a blur as I just focused on what was ahead of me. I don't know how long I ran for, but eventually I felt something heavy crash into me. I hit the ground roughly and felt the wind get knocked out of me, and I briefly saw the shadowed outline of a hulking figure before I fell unconscious from the hard impact. When I woke up, everything was still dark. I wondered if I was even still alive. 
All I knew was that it was dark and I couldn't move. Then I heard a groan from nearby. Oh, shit. I heard Leader's voice say softly before I heard a slight rustling like something was struggling. Leader? I croaked out in question. And then I heard a gasp from nearby. Oh, thank fucking goodness you're still alive, she breathed. Then she let out a more frustrated sound. But that means they caught you. Look, I have a plan to get us out of here, but you need to do exactly what I say if you want to survive this, she said in a hushed tone. What about Hank? I whispered back, and Lita was quiet for a long moment before she spoke up again. Hank's beyond saving now. You, you don't want to know, trust me. She said with a pained whisper. Now stop talking. You don't want them knowing you're awake. And whatever you do, don't let them feed you anything. She said with a renewed, steely tone. I did as I was told and shut up after that. I don't know how long we stayed in that darkness. I could feel myself suspended in the air and completely unable to move. Felt like I was wrapped up in some kind of cocoon made of a sticky substance similar to that of a spider's web. It was exactly the same conditions that Abigail had described in her story. The only sounds I heard all that time were an occasional shuffling, which I assumed to be Lida, and the distant sound of footsteps and soft growls. After what could have been hours or even days of just staying silent in that oppressive darkness, I heard a ripping noise and then a loud thunk and a grunt. I wanted to speak, but remembered Leader's words and forced myself to remain quiet. I just waited and hoped that that was the sound of Leader escaping. I heard footsteps approaching me and held my breath while attempting to press myself back against the stone wall behind me on a deep-rooted instinct to cringe away from the unknown thing that was approaching. And then I heard a ripping noise shortly before my bindings gave way and I went crashing unceremoniously to the rock floor below. While I lay there with the wind knocked out of me, Leader ripped the sticky bindings away from me and I quickly scrambled to my feet. You're going to have to trust me. Stay close to me and I'll get you out of here. Leader whispered in my ear. I nodded before realizing she couldn't see me in the pitch darkness and instead whispered back, Okay. It was all I could think to say at that moment. I heard a strange crunching noise and then Leader grabbed my hand and started to swiftly lead me along as if she was able to see where she was going. I noticed that her nails felt sharper than before as she held tight to my hand, and I felt fear bubble up as I wondered if she was becoming something like what Abigail had turned into. But I forced myself to bury that fear. Right then, Lida was my only chance of making it out of that place. I had to trust her. I didn't have any other option. We moved through the darkness for what seemed like forever, we seemed to be moving through some sort of massive tunnel or cave network like the one from Abigail's story. We'd mostly move with hurried steps, but on various occasions Leader would stop me and pull me into little crevices or side tunnels when the sounds of footsteps neared us. Then, after the footsteps had faded, we would continue on our way again. I began to wonder if we'd be wandering this cave network until we finally just collapsed. I could already feel the hunger, the dehydration, and exhaustion gnawing at me. But I kept pace with Lida, forcing myself to keep walking even when it felt like my legs were turning to stone. And I finally saw a beautiful sight. There was light streaming into the stony area about 15 feet ahead of us after we turned a corner. As we drew closer to the light, I could see that it was moonlight streaming into a large hole of some sort that looked to have been dug by massive claws. The hole was roughly five feet above us and led into some kind of tunnel to the surface. I felt my heart sink as I realized there was no way we could reach the hole to escape through it. We would have to continue on back into the darkness. Hey, I'll boost you up to the edge of the hole. Do you think you can pull yourself out? Lita spoke up as I let myself fall into a crestfallen state. I looked at Lita's petite five-foot form in bewilderment. I felt my eyes widen as I finally was able to take in her appearance. Lida's form had changed. She'd grown more muscled and she looked practically feral. 
Her short black hair was wild and she was covered in dirt. But she looked uninjured despite her dirty appearance and very torn, blood-stained clothing. Her nails had turned to claws, and when she spoke I could see that her teeth had changed to sharpened points. When I finally met her eyes, they were no longer that piercing hazel green that they had been. No, now her pupils had changed to slits and her eyes were a glowing gold shade. I instinctively took a few steps back from her as I took in her inhuman features, and she finally grabbed my wrist. Now isn't the time, I told you. If you want to make it out of this, you're going to have to trust me, she said firmly. I slowly nodded, and she released me in return. Then she laced her fingers together and placed her palms upward to allow me to step on them so she could lift me to the hole. I complied, and she lifted me with surprising ease. I dug my fingers into the dirt and scrabbled my way up through the hole and out into the forest above. I collapsed onto the ground on my back taking in deep lungfuls of air for a moment, and I'd had a sort of laugh of relief to be away from that horrid darkness. But then I remembered Leda. I looked down through the hole that appeared to be an animal burrow hidden beneath a large, thick bush from the outside. Leda looked up at me with glowing golden orbs before she jumped upwards and dug her clawed hands into the dirt. I grabbed her hands and helped pull her out of the hole, though I'm not entirely sure she needed my help at all. Once we were both out into the forest, Leda held a hand up when she saw me about to speak. No, no questions. Not until we're out of here. Don't talk, just follow and do what I say. That's how you're going to make it out to see the sunrise, she said in a voice that left no room for argument. I just nodded in response to show her I understood. She nodded back and then we were off. The forest was still as strangely quiet as it was when we were captured, and I wondered if it was even the same night anymore. I had no idea how many days had passed since we'd been taken down into the cave network. We could have been down in that cave system for days, for all I knew. We just walked in silence as the moon moved across the sky. I didn't ask where we were going. All I needed to do at that point was to follow Leda and hope that she had a plan. Leda seemed to tense some as we walked, but she said nothing beyond making a circular upward motion with her hand that I took to mean as, be on your guard. Mm, you're quite the clever little girl. Such a shame that you chose the wrong side of this wall. A deep rumbling voice spoke that seemed to echo around us. Leda let out a soft growl in response. Yeah, if you're so upset about it, then why not come and handle me yourself? Unless you're too scared to face me directly. You seem chicken shit with the way you're having all your lackeys do the fighting for you. She barked back, which earned cold laughter from the voice. Which I assumed to belong to the coyote, since it was the only one of the creatures I'd heard actually speak up to that point. Then a dark shape seemed to emerge from a nearby oak tree that quickly shifted and took the form of that coyote I was beginning to grow familiar with seeing. It was grinning at us with its head cocked to the side ever so slightly, as if it were amused. As you wish, he said, before he rushed at us with alarming speed. Leda was backhanded hard enough that she went flying through a number of trees which crashed to the ground as she skidded to a stop on all fours roughly thirty feet away. The deep gouges in her forearms she'd gotten from the coyote's claws were already healing as she charged at him. The coyote let out a roar that was mixed with laughter as Leda charged as if it was relishing the challenge that had been presented to it. The ensuing fight was one I only caught glimpses of as I attempted to distance myself from the two. I saw glimpses of Leda savagely tearing into the coyote and drawing inky black blood from the thing with each hit. Oh, she was superhumanly strong with the way she was able to send the coyote flying. It had grown to be at least twice her size by that point, with a far more muscled figure than its previously gaunt form. The fight between the two seemed as if it would never end, as they destroyed the forest around them. Every time the two dealt injuries to the other, they would heal almost as fast as they were given. Trees fell around the two, and slowly the battle zone was changed more into a clearing filled with jagged stumps and fallen trees. 
Despite Lida's strength, she still seemed out of her league against the coyote. As fast as she was able to heal, the coyote still dealt more damage than Lida, and seemed to land attacks on her far more often than she did to it. And yet she never seemed to tire or give up. She just looked at the coyote with this deep-seated rage as she stubbornly continued to battle it. I stayed hidden behind a large rock on a small cliff near the battlefield. Well, I should have run, but I just couldn't as I watched in horror, and yet almost wonder, as the two superhuman entities clashed. I just silently hoped that their fight would not come near me, as I knew I'd only get in the way or get hurt in this battle between two things who were far beyond the strength of a normal person like me. I could already see Lida was facing a challenge against the coyote, with it only having one arm, and I wondered just how dangerous would this thing be without that handicap. Then I quickly pushed that thought away, as I felt panic overtaking me at that idea. Whatever the hell this thing was, it was a monster of overwhelming strength that I could still barely fathom the existence of. Finally, the coyote got the upper hand if you could even really call the hulking, patchy, furred thing a coyote anymore. It managed to pin Lida to the ground with its massive clawed hand holding her down by her throat and upper chest. Ah, oh, Lida choked and gagged as she clawed and kicked at the coyote's arm, but it just laughed at her struggling, even with her claws tearing chunks from its arm. I felt panic build up in my chest at the sight. I felt as if I had to do something to help Lida, but I had no idea what to do. If Lida wasn't able to stop that thing, there was no way I stood a chance. But I decided that I couldn't leave Lida to just perish at the hands of this thing. I'd already lost Hank. I couldn't just stand by and lose her too. I picked up a heavy rock from the ground nearby and attempted to stealthily approach the coyote while its attention was focused on Lida. You make such delicious prey, little girl. Such a shame you didn't last longer. It's been so long since I've been provided with such a challenge. My compliments. <laughs> Even your mother wasn't quite so strong as you. But alas, you'll suffer the same fate as she did. Coyote hummed with glee, while Lida glared up at it with seething hatred in her expression. <sighs> I'll kill you, she snarled back in a choked, gasping voice as she more viciously attempted to struggle loose from the grip of the thing. Ah, still so spirited. I'm sure that fire in you will only make you even more delectable. Oh, morsel. The coyote chuckled then, simply seeming amused by Lida's fury. The coyote opened its jaws wide as its face split into four even pieces and opened like horrific flower petals to reveal a large black maw lined with white needle-sharp teeth and out from its throat flickered a deep red tongue, reminiscent of a massive octopus tentacle lined with suckers that had silver spikes at the centers. I rushed forward to hurl the rock right at the head of the creature and hopefully distract it long enough to get Lida loose. The thing closed in as if aiming to bite into Lida with its monstrous mouth. I felt a sinking in my chest. I was too late. Even with Lida's astounding healing abilities, there was no way she could survive her head being bitten off. But then the thing's chest exploded in black gore as a loud bang sounded throughout the forest. Its body was soon torn apart by more explosions as more loud bangs filled the forest. Lida bolted to her feet as the creature's body started to dissolve into that black liquid I'd seen the other things dissolve into. Its head flopped to the ground and changed back to the more coyote-like shape. Somehow it even spoke, with its head now being the only solid piece of it left. This isn't over, it hissed out. You haven't seen the last of me. We will have our victory, it gasped and then its head exploded in another burst of gore, and all that was left of the beast was puddles of black goo that quickly dried and floated up into the air in little black flecks as the sky started to change with the first shades of dawn. I felt the rock drop from my hands as a familiar voice spoke from the edge of the tree line. You sure made quite a mess here, huh? I turned and couldn't quite believe my eyes. 
There Briggs stood with a shotgun in hand and a proud grin present on his face. Leader gave Briggs a withering look in response. Ah, took you long enough, Grandpa. Those damn reinforcements you promised were almost too late. We lost some good people while you jackasses sat around with your thumbs up your asses, she scolded the older man. I felt my mind begin to swim as I tried to process all the events that had transpired over the course of this terrifying affair. As I tried to take in the scene in front of me, of the heated back and forth between Leader and Briggs, all their voices sounded like, well, to me, they were faraway echoes. Blackness started to form at the edges of my vision, and then I fell unconscious. When I woke up, I was in a hospital in the nearest city to the state park. I was told I'd been transported to the hospital from a clinic in the nearby town to the state park. According to the hospital staff, I'd been brought in with deep gashes, dehydrated and emaciated. Well, I'd apparently woken up and spoken deliriously of monstrous animals attacking. And so, it was assumed I'd been attacked by either a bear or a wild cat, based on my injuries, and had become lost in the forest for days before eventually being discovered by two hikers. Well, at first, I attempted to argue and recount what really happened, but I quickly figured out that the hospital staff just assumed I was still delirious. They weren't going to believe me, and I did discover that it had been a week and a half since the night that those things first attacked. After I was discharged from hospital, I immediately quit my job at the state park. My supervisors didn't ask any questions. I saw that a missing persons report had been filled out for Hank, but no law enforcement ever questioned me about what happened at the state park. In fact, there were never any reports at all of what happened in the state park that night. And after that night, the strange animal sightings in the park just fizzled off soon after. I thought about going to the police and telling them my story about what had happened, but I knew that they would just ignore what I said. <laughs> after all... Who would believe such a strange story? I hadn't believed Abigail at first. Surely no one would believe me either. Since then, I've moved across the country to a large city in an arid climate full of flatlands and deserts. I want to be far away from any forest. I know that the media and law enforcement won't believe my story, but I recently heard about this subreddit from my girlfriend. She's the only one I've told this story to since then. And she's the only one who believes me. She encouraged me to post this here. I think she hopes it'll be therapeutic for me. But I decided to post this story because I want to warn anyone who'll listen. Watch out for the forests. There are things out in those deep woods far beyond human comprehension. Whatever I saw in that forest, I have no doubt that there's more out there. I remember what it said to Leader. It mentioned a war. It said it would be coming back. The people that go missing out in the forests. Oh, strange things that happen. Maybe there really isn't a logical explanation for all of it. And so, if you start to see animals that look wrong with those white eyes in a forest, get out while you still have the chance. Or they might just come for you next. Well, I hope that my tale will serve as a warning to all of you who choose to listen to it. I haven't seen Leader or Briggs since that night. I can only hope they're doing well wherever they are. Well, I still wonder what those animal things were that attacked me that night. I'm too scared to really go looking for the answers I want. As far as I'm concerned, I hope I never have to step into another forest again. But another part of me has started to become less scared over the years. I feel angry for all the horrors those things brought on. They killed innocent and good people like those college kids and Hank. I want to know what they are. And I want to stop them. There's a state park a few hundred miles from me. And I've seen increasing reports of animal attacks and missing persons there lately. Maybe I should go there and warn them before things go too far.
Well, what did you think of that one? That's exactly the kind of story that I know you always love, and it brings in many, many viewers just hungry for this kind of thing. Well, I thought that was great. Really, really delighted to read that one for you all. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I will do my best to join in the conversation. Well, it's been one hell of a day for me. But, well, I just have to give you a story on Monday, don't I? Of course I do. Oh, it's not even Monday, it's Wednesday. Oh, I'm losing track of time here, I really am. Well, that's it for this evening. Podcast coming back tomorrow? Oh, and another thing. This is officially... Six years of doing this for me. Can you believe it? Six years I've been doing this. I was rubbish to begin with. And hopefully I've uh, gotten a lot better <laughs> over the course of time. So, so thank you all for sticking with me. Uh, looking back on some of those early subscribers, I see quite a few of you from when I only had like 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, are still listening. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So thanks to them, man. Thanks to all of you who stuck around all this time. I'm going nowhere. Be doing this for a fair few years still to come. So, hope you're still enjoying it. <laughs> Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams. And bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, you want to know more about me? I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.